Hello everyone, it's Kevin Adkisson coming to you live at five with another tour of Cranbrook's rich history of art, science, and education. And I'm really thrilled about today's tour. Um, I have been generously allowed back into the Cranbrook Academy of Art Library by our head librarian, Judy Dykey, and she and I have pulled out some really wonderful treasures of the collection of Cranbrook Academy of Art's library. Most of the pieces that we're going to be looking at today actually come from the library of George Booth, who of course lived in Cranbrook House and built his own 1918 library to house his collection of books. Uh, but in 1942, when this complex of buildings opened, he transferred most of his art folios and architecture books, as well as history and design books, here to the Academy of Art Library. So, of course, the library is entered in off the peristyle, or what Sarnin called his Grand Arcade. And so we enter past um, St. Paul becoming struck, converted, and we enter in through these solid bronze doors. And just like the art students do, uh, I come in and I find a wealth of knowledge, sort of endless books. The library goes uh, from uh, uh, very traditional text all the way up to contemporary art and design. So it really is a full service um, master's level library. It is circulating for the students, so you never know what condition the books will come back in. Um, and then of course there are newspapers and magazines. Now this uh, building was dedicated in 1942 uh, and George Booth and Sarnin really viewed it as a sort of uh, pedagogical approach that the student would come to Cranbrook. They already were meant to be sort of masters or advanced students in their discipline. Uh, but they would begin their studies by coming to the library and seeing the history of art and reading about the history of art in books. And then they would walk across and they would see the history of art uh, in the museum, and then they would head down the steps, go out to their studios, and they would make the next generation of, uh, of art. The library is open to anyone when, uh, when, when Cranbrook reopens or when the world reopens, the library, anyone can come and do research. Great question. Um, the furniture that we're seeing is all designed by Eliel Saarinen. This is reproduction upholstery. Uh, but it, it mirrors the original upholstery. You'll see that Sarnin designs uh, with molded plywood uh, backs and then these wonderful S-shaped molded plywood legs underneath the Formica top. Uh, and so you see Sarnin's sort of influence from his uh, son, Arrow, and from his employee, Charles Eames, uh, who are doing experiments here at Cranbrook with molded plywood at the same time. Just some historic photographs of the library from around the time of its opening. Uh, you can see the original funny little lamps and how uh, quiet it must have been with one person at each seat and then the librarian's desk with her telephone there. Um, these wonderful lights that hang down originally from this uninterrupted ceiling with no sort of um, ceiling acne popping out and then other historic photographs. You'll notice the Maya Grotel uh, vessel there, Grotel the great Finnish American potter. Uh, all of Cranbrook's buildings were meant to have, um, to incorporate art and sculpture. And so you do see a piece by Grotel on the pedestal here, and then by our first sculptor in residence, Carl Millis up above in wood. Now, the root of our tour today uh, we'll head a loop around the first floor of the library and then we'll come back and we'll look at some of the treasures that I've pulled out. Um, so the furniture, again, these are, that one is sort of delaminating, I won't point it out. Uh, they are these funky sort of uh, molded plywood chairs with these fun plywood legs. And these are alial sarnin, they aren't aero sarnin, but you see this, this real... Um, connection to what his son was doing and the influence of the younger generation on the older uh, architect. And then round tables, little reading nook, and then this great wall of northern light. And so 
uh, the library gets all indirect light. And so you have this very even wash coming across uh, as you're studying. You don't get harsh southern light. And then there are these glass blocks at the lower level, which uh, diffuse the light and diffuse the view. So we don't get distracted by whatever comings and going are happening outside. And then the light fixtures as well are Aelil Sarnan's design. Uh, and he's done his sort of favorite way of lighting, which is uplighting these torchères. So he shoots the light up onto these enamel uh, uh, plated metal disc, and then it reflects back down into the room. He also cleverly puts lights on top of the bookcases. Uh, and so these lights are shining down so we can select the books, but then there are also lights on top of here that shine up and make the entire ceiling a reflective surface. Now, if we step around here, um, we'll see some of the historic text. And so these large volumes are some of my favorites uh, because they have all the historic architectural text, including the section of architecture books over here, uh, like McKim Mead and White's amazing four-part folio from the 19-teens. So I have pulled out a number of books, um, and we're going to look at some books about gardens, some books about the arts and crafts, and then a couple of just really spectacular early modern books. So to get started, uh, my camera is just acting up a little bit. Let's restart. I hope everyone had a nice Memorial Day and that you're enjoying this very warm weather. Okay, there we go. So I want to start with Humphrey Repton, who's of course the great English landscape architect. Uh, and this is his theory and practice on landscape gardening and some remarks on the Grecian and Gothic architecture of 1803. Uh, and Repton, who had had a sort of unsuccessful start as a textile trader, experimental farmer, um, uh, male coach, inventor. Uh, he really gets into sort of gentleman landscape farming. And so he is one of the, the fathers of, of landscape architecture, um, along with Capability Brown. And I pulled out this book so that I could show you an example of a haha -ha wall, which we saw last Thursday when we were looking at the Cranbrook Natatorium in the way that from the art museum uh, to the Cranbrook Natatorium, you can't see the bus turn around. Here we see Repton's design of uh, the haha -ha wall. So from the manor home or wherever the view is, uh, you look across, you cannot see the little people on their footpath, and then you look straight down to the view, and it has this sort of uh, perfect way of shielding whatever undesirable scene you want to hide. But the real uh, masterpiece of this book are his hinge slips attached to colored plates. And so these colored plates, hand-colored, uh, they show you the view as it is. And who wants to look at this scene from Wentworth, Yorkshire, with this, uh, I don't know what that is, a mine, some sort of quarry. And you have this lovely temple, but it's obscured by the workmen. And so Repton shows us, ah, this is what you should do. And so he gives you these sort of improvements to the landscape as you uh, flip and unflip the book. Now, if I could do a weaving demonstration one-handed, we can do a book tour one-handed. So just a couple of others. Um, here's the principal view of Blaise Castle, um, which is apparently too somber for the character of a villa. And so to create an area of interest, he suggests adding a little cottage, uh, which will enhance the view and sort of brighten the gloomy wood. And then the last one that I picked out for you is one of my favorites, where you have this, you know, disconnected uh, Gothic church and a little Gothic building, and wouldn't it look better if it were all one seamless Gothic uh, connector? 
So this is from 1803, and this was in George Booth's library. Other things that were in George Booth's library that I think really uh, inspired his design of the Cranbrook House Gardens, uh, things like Edith Wharton's Italian Villas and Their Gardens, which was published serially first, um, uh, and then came out in book form in 1903. And she advises her readers not to replicate exactly an Italian garden, uh, but to be inspired by the garden and then bring the attitude uh, back to America. And so she has these really wonderful printed color plates. Uh, George and Ellen Booth, of course, visited Italy. Um, and you can see that their garden at Cranbrook House is very much indebted to Edith Wharton's designs. What's fascinating about this book, when I pulled it out of the special collections today, here is a sketch by George Booth, which was unknown uh, to me at least uh, before today. And so George Booth sketched some sort of garden villa with pool uh, and then pasted it into his copy of Edith Wharton. Now, the next book that I want to show uh, is Charles Platt, who was an American architect, uh, get landscape designer, thinker. Um, he was quite a prominent um, landscape gardener in the manner of Edith Wharton. Uh, and I would attribute much of Cranbrook House's gardens to the work of Platt as well. Uh, and you see things that will have a sort of direct repetition at Cranbrook House. So you have this uh, old well that is this sort of fantasy well. You have the pergola, just like at Cranbrook House. Even the way that the views are framed through columns and colonnades. And then elements like the garden wall becoming uh, smooth and then the balustrade. Even those benches really look like things that you see at Cranbrook House. So I think it's quite fascinating to see the books that George Booth had and then the uh, building that he created around campus. This is 19 teens, I believe. Next, we have one of just the greatest books ever published, and it has been published multiple times, so you yourself can order it on Amazon right now or as soon as you finish this tour. Uh, and, First published in 1856, this is an 1868 copy of Owen Jones' The Grammar of Ornament. And The Grammar of Ornament grew out of the 1851 uh, Great Exhibition in London, and it is a guidebook for all the world's known ornament systems. And so it was meant to sort of improve Victorian design. You could select these books that he helpfully gives us color patterns as well. Uh, and then you could just deploy in the Egyptian style around a room. Um, plenty of pages of the Greek style of ornament. Then you have, uh, here we have Persian style ornament. And he also does botanic studies. And he goes um, all the way to illuminated manuscript ornament. And illuminated manuscripts became this real passion of the arts and crafts movement and of uh, Owen Jones in particular, this idea that everything after the Renaissance was terrible. Uh, and so Owen Jones in this lavishly and often published book uh, gives us these careful studies of proper ornament design. And so this is an example of a design source book where the craftsman or the designer, the architect, would have this book in their library and then study his designs and adapt them into the real world. And I wanted to show uh, Owen Jones's illuminated manuscript because shortly after he published The Grammar of Ornament, uh, he published this incredible title page for uh, Henry Noel Humphreys, The Illuminated Book of the, Manu of the Middle Ages, an account of the development and process of the art of illumination as a distinct branch of pictorial ornamentation from the 4th to the 16th century. And this is London, 1859. This is again in the collection of George Booth. Uh, and I mean, just look at this stunning line work and the uh, ornament. You can see how George, uh, how Owen Jones is sort of taking from his own source book and then repeating it for this great frontispiece. And then the book itself is an example of medieval 
manuscripts and they've been reprinted. The coloration is, is very much in that Owen Jonesy mid Victorian bright greens, bright pinks, um, golds, dark reds. But they are historic examples that are reprinted here. And this is an example of the sort of scale of the book that eventually when George Booth gave all of these to the Cranbrook Library, uh, he had to put a tapestry over his folio shelves because he uh, no longer had the folios and they took up so much space. And you can see where they lived in the Academy collection. And as the Academy has grown, um, the, the shelves have become more and more double stacked. Now, I wanted to point out uh, a couple of other books here about medieval, ab about sort of manuscript history, because George Booth will become a printer, which we'll get to some of his books later on. But I think it's interesting the amount of books that he had in his collection that were about printing and illuminating. And so this is The Art of Illuminating uh, Books, and it has a very long essay about uh, how to illuminate properly, but then it also gives examples. And so just like in the grammar of ornament, um, where Owen Jones was showing us sort of architectural and de decorative ornament systems, here you have book ornament systems. And I should note that I am not a uh, antiquarian or fine book scholar, so as I use the wrong terms here, please forgive me. Um, I wanted to take it fast forward all the way to France, 1922, um, to a little book just to show you that this sort of genre does not die out. And so this is a really amazing Art Nouveau book. Uh, and this one doesn't have a George Booth book plate in it, so it may have been bought for the Art Academy um, outright. But it has these really fabulous um, French... Art Nouveau, early modern designs in really fabulous color combinations. They make me think of some of the things that Pipson Sarn and Swanson was designing for her father and his buildings. If you have questions, do type them in. So moving on from these sort of um, uh, medieval revival books, we get to the great text uh, one of the most beautiful books ever published in the history of mankind, of book printing, uh, which is the Kelmscott Chaucer, uh, published by William Morris's Kelmscott Press. Uh, the book was published in the very end of William Morris's life. Um, he was quite old, and they rushed to finish it. It took four years to publish uh, the Kelmscott Chaucer, and Morris was so ill that he, he slowed down the process somewhat because he was designing all the lettering, uh, but the other artisans began to sort of speed up the process to try and get it published before he died, and it did come out in 1896, the year that William Morris uh, died. And this is considered the masterpiece of Morris's Kelmscott Press. Um, he printed 53 different books from 1891 to 98, uh, and he named the press after his uh, country home, Kelmscott, and this was really a, uh, a team effort. And so Edward Byrne Jones did all of the illustration. Uh, the text was edited by Frederick Ellis, and then the images had to be engraved from uh, Byrne Jones's design, Byrne Jones, the great pre-Raphaelite painter. And to turn them in from paintings, or, or however he designed them at first, into woodcuts, um, William Hooper actually used a system where he photographed the original Byrne Jones pieces and then transferred the photograph onto a woodblock. So in this sort of medieval revival, there was this very modern system used to produce the book. It is set in Chaucer, that is the, the typeface, uh, which was custom designed by Morris for this book. Uh, and it features these wonderful custom letters. It has the classic red and black, and then the most wonderful foliated ornament you've ever seen with these scrolls just sort of writhing around the page. I don't know enough about Chaucer to tell you um, much more about what's happening in this book, 
uh, but I do know that it is quite beautiful. And this is uh, uh, the original board bounding, binding. It was recently restored at the University of Michigan by a, an art restorer there. And this was in George Booth's collection. So as we move on from our socialist friend, William Morris, Oh, I do want to show you a couple other things. Uh, the Kelmscott is being held in this wooden um, cradle designed and produced by Lincoln Eddy, who was the longtime head of the Cranbrook Academy Woodshop in the 70s to the 90s. Uh, but here is a copy of the receipt um, from George Booth's purchase of the Kelmscott Chaucer. You'll see he bought it four years after it was published. It did sell out before it was uh, released. Um, and George Booth bought it for 75 pounds, which is an absolute steal. Uh, here is the original binding that had to be removed during the preservation of the book. Next up, uh, we have a couple of more arts and crafts books that I want to look at, including The Flower Book by Edward Byrne Jones. Sorry about that. The Flower Book was published by Byrne Jones's widow after his death about 1903, I think. Uh, and it features, there's actually not a single painting of a flower in the book. Instead, they are little scenes that he painted just for his entertainment, uh, inspired by flowers. And so it's, it, they, he painted these over the 1890s and early 1900s, and then she published them after his death. Is this entertaining volume. One other great arts and crafts uh, book that George Booth had uh, is a copy of uh, The Heroes, which is illustrated by a Scottish illustrator who has these great paintings that were reproduced using a, a celluloid and watercolor technique. Let's see, this one does not want to open for me. Get out of there. I particularly love this illustration. And the artist did produce this book for his children, or the, the text was written for children, so it's Greek uh, classic tales written for children. There we have George Booth's book plate, proving it did come out of his collection. And this is by Charles Kingsley. The heroes are Greek fairy tales for my children. And the illustrator is William Russell Flint. And we have three copies of illustrated books by Flint here in the collection. And this brings us to the Cranbrook Press. And so our next collection of books uh, were all published by George Booth between 1900 and 1902. Uh, George Booth was so interested in the arts and crafts movement uh, before he founded the Detroit Society of Arts and Crafts, before he bought the property that became Cranbrook, before he started the Cranbrook Art Academy, uh, he launched the Cranbrook Press, which was inspired by William Morris and the Kelmscott Press. He had multiple Kelmscott Press books. Uh, he bought the Kelmscott Chaucer after the press had begun. Uh, and he operated his press out of the attic of the Detroit News. So his father-in-law established the Detroit Evening News. George Booth, after he married Ellen Scripps in 1887, became uh, manager and then eventually publisher of the news. But he never sort of lost that idea of uh, pre-industrial pre-industrialization, celebration of the handcrafted, uh, admiring medieval manuscripts. And so uh, from 1900 until 1902, uh, he published nine books, including the book of Revelation, which we see here. And they're quite desirable for collectors now, especially to try and get a full run of all nine. Uh, and you'll see that he's inspired by William Morris's uh, use of the Chaucer font. He's using an adaptation of the Troy typeface from the Kelmscott Press. Just like Morris, uh, George Booth actually designed all of the scroll work around the pages. He even used Morris's alignment of the pages, where you have one, one unit here, two across the top, three on the side, and four on the bottom. Uh, what William Morris argued was the most beautiful way to lay out a book. And then he borrowed from Drewer, which he had a copy of Drewer's prints, uh, the illustrations are the prints. And so these are Albrecht Drewer, 
uh, prints within the George Booth Cranbrook Press Book of Revelation. And at the very end, we get uh, the Cranbrook George G. Booth logo. So those of you who know the Center for Collections and Research, my division well, know that that is the C, that is our C for Cranbrook. Uh, and this is uh, this would have been two years before he even bought this property. So before the land named Cranbrook or the house named Cranbrook or the institutions named Cranbrook, uh, it was the Cranbrook Press named after Cranbrook in Kent County. Now, there's a couple of copies of the Book of Revelation, including this one with an unknown binder. Uh, so George Booth sold them in vellum bindings, and then you had them bound for yourself. And so uh, this is a really exquisite unknown binder. He also published a sort of newsletter called the Cranbrook Papers. This is a bound copy, though they came loose, uh, which were hand-colored by George's sister. So she was the colorist. Uh, and if you think back to those guidebooks to uh, illuminating text, I think you can see where George Booth was studying in order to create these beautiful Cranbrook Papers. And he wrote mostly about printing. And so all hand-colored watercolors here. Now, there's just a couple of other examples from the Academy Library that I want to show with, share with you today, uh, including an example, just so you don't think that we only have sort of English arts and crafts books and George Booth. There were lots of American arts and crafts printers, including the Roycrofters, um, and so this is an example of the Roycroft Press, which uh, not as artistic as the Cranbrook Press, certainly. And then, of course, how did George Booth learn about the arts and crafts? But he was subscribed to the Craftsman Magazine, which was Gustav Stickley's publication coming out of uh, Stickley's Craftsman Farms in New Jersey. Uh, and so George Booth had uh, those books as well. And I thought I'd end here with just two uh, interesting examples that I wasn't familiar with from the Rare Book Room. I do most of my thinking on the arts and crafts or architecture. Uh, this is a Russian artist, a French book. Um, uh, and his name is Leon Basque, B-A-K-S-T. Uh, it's 1913, Paris published, and he was a Russian portrait artist and designer who made his career designing costumes in Paris and just these wonderful costumes for different um, operas, as well as his designs for scenery and stage sets. I don't know, oh, The Agony of St. Sebastian. So there's, for the artists who are studying here at Cranbrook, there really is just endless inspiration. And then the last book that I'll leave you with uh, is from the Wiener Werkstätte. Uh, this is a 1929 book. Apparently, it was sort of hated by some of the, the members of the Wiener Werkstätte. Uh, it's a history of the 25 years from 1903 to 1928 of the Austrian design school, store, and movement. And it's made of paper mache. And the color, cover is by Vali Westlier. Uh, and then the back is, in, is by Gudrun Bodish. Uh, and it's all paper mache relief. The book on the inside is lovely as well, um, the sort of history of the Wiener Werkstatt, but nothing compares to this really amazing paper mache cover. So now you know a little bit more about some of uh, my favorite treasures from the Cranbrook Academy of Art Library. I hope that you've enjoyed this short tour. I hope that we reopen soon so that you can come and see some of these pieces from the special collection uh, and that you can also come and explore the many works of contemporary art. Uh, we have every art magazine that could possibly be published. And so again, it's non-circulating if you are not a student, um, but if you ever want to come and just have a lovely, quiet afternoon, uh, you can come and explore many of the fine collections here at Cranbrook. I hope everyone is doing well, being safe. Tomorrow, um, I will be coming live at five on our Facebook group page from the Cranbrook Institute of Science. Uh, and on Thursday, who knows where I'll be, but I'll be back here on Instagram, live at five Eastern Standard Time, I'm Kevin Ankison, the curator for the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. I'm so glad you could join us today here at the library.